Uh, we're here to review a project that happened amidst the beginning of COVID. So as we as we all remember, there was that moment where uh, there was this big need for ventilators or the belief of the need for ventilators. And there was a lot of um, DIY efforts coming up around those. Uh, we didn't start there because it was, uh, we recognized the complexity that was involved. And, uh, but ultimately we got to a place where we figured out that uh, we thought we needed to, to make a go. And um, this is to show what we learned. Um, I thought it was from a, a person who's playing a support role, not central to, to building it. I was really amazed to see all the different elements of making that were incorporated into it and uh, something that seemed really unachievable uh, being something that actually could be achieved. Uh, thankfully, it was never required to be called into service, uh, but I think it's a, it's a lesson as far as what we can do if we put our minds to it and uh, collaborate. So without further ado, I wanna turn it over to uh, Lior that from Make Haven's point of view, uh, took the lead on this, this effort. Hi all, uh, my name is Lior. I'm the shop manager here at Make Haven. And as Jared was saying, we prior to starting this project had worked on a whole bunch of, of different projects in uh, one after the other and, and sometimes at the same time at Make Haven with regard to COVID, both helping to support the community as well as nearby hospitals. Um, we did a lot of that work in conjunction with healthcare providers and hospital administrators so we could have a good finger on the pulse of, of what was wanted and needed. Um, we worked in collaboration with United Way as well as other groups to help distribute the things that we were making and um, all of it could only have happened because of all of the members uh, at Makehaven who chose to stay members even though we were closed by and large. Um, thanks to a, a board of directors who was interested in letting this happen. There are a lot of other institutions that had capable tooling that weren't willing to take that, that risk. Um, and staff that, um, that could, could take their time and work on a project that wasn't strictly to the benefit of Makehaven in a, in a direct way. And so um, after we had gone through a whole bunch of other projects, all of which were were super exciting. Um, making thousands of face masks as well as face shields for hospitals, um, making intubation boxes for for practitioners when they were, were intubating patients. Um, we saw that one of the groups that we had been looking to for advice and guidance on uh, how to make various kinds of devices. Um, and this was an online group that was made up of both engineers as well as healthcare providers offering their guidance on what were things that could be made safely and that would be effective and helpful. Um, they had vetted a large number of ventilator designs. And for those who aren't aware, a ventilator is a machine used in the healthcare setting uh, that breathes for a patient. So. There are situations when a patient isn't able to breathe for themselves, and that can be the result of surgery. They can they can be intentionally sedated, and they can no longer breathe for themselves, and that's that's the normal use of a ventilator. And then there can be cases where they're very sick, and their lungs are no longer functioning well enough to maintain their, their body's oxygenation, and so um, so in, intubation. It's used where a tube is put down their trachea and a ventilator is used to perfuse their lungs to get oxygen into their body. Um, if you look at a ventilator in a hospital, it is a very complicated, expensive machine built to incredibly high tolerances. We're lucky here at Makehaven to have a lot of members who work as engineers at medical device companies, Medtronic among them, and they have experience making ventilators and the kind of tolerances they work to are incredible. Testing millions of cycles, uh, making sure that there's complete electrical isolation using really high tolerance components. Um, and, and these devices are very impressive and have tons and tons of features and it takes someone 
years to, to really master the use of a ventilator uh, in, you know, with all of its capabilities. So um, this group that was looking at all the various ventilator designs knew from the get-go that we were not trying to build a ventilator that did everything. Um, this is an emergency ventilator that was specialized for one purpose, uh, and that was to respond to COVID. Um, when a patient has, has COVID and is no longer able to breathe for themselves, uh, it's usually as a result of ARDS, ARDS, Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome, and that is often treated with this, in general, uh, like one family of treatments that a ventilator provides. So you don't need a lot of the other settings that an off-the-shelf fancy ventilator has. So that simplified the problem for us. Um, and then we had waited until a lot of these other projects had already been vetted. And one came out on top. It's called the AmboVent out of Israel. And the AmboVent came out on top for a whole bunch of reasons. One was simplicity. Um, another was how easy it was to fabricate, how much it had been tested. And um, at the time, it hadn't been accepted for use yet in Israeli hospitals, but it had under undergone significant testing by healthcare providers as well as engineers. Um, and, and we decided to give that one a go. So AmboVent, this group out of Israel, was incredibly generous with their designs as well as their time. So uh, we spoke with them about how they came to where they got to and how they, they put it all together. And when we had questions, you know, we were able to confer with them. And our goal was initially to take their design and build the thing. Um, and, you know, nothing ever goes exactly to plan, as you will, as you will see. Um, but we were able to take that starting point and, and run with it pretty far. So um, one of the, the main, one of the many roadblocks during COVID or, or speed bumps was sourcing. So not only was everyone on the planet trying to get the same things as soon as like the, the group had thought about the things that we would want. Um, you know, cause everyone sort of realized at the same time, oh, we wanna make face masks and we need elastic. And within a day, the planet's supply of elastic had disappeared. And so similarly with, with the ventilator sourcing was difficult. Um, we had to get really creative with where we found the things. Normally a source like McMaster car is is just the engineer's garden of eden you know it has absolutely everything you want you click and it comes the next day um and even mcmaster car was had a two-week lead time on, on a lot of parts um so that was a that was a challenge um a lot of the designs that came from the israelis had been made in a hurry um by different groups so it didn't always form a clear, cohesive picture, and they had already gone through a bunch of iterations. So sometimes they would overlap and be a little hard to follow. So our group consisted of a medical group, and so they were advising from the medical perspective. That was made up of doctors from Yale, as well as Montreal, and a whole bunch of other institutions, locations. And there was an electronics team, and then a mechanical team. And so these groups, uh, worked both separately and together on each of the components. And um, I think what might be good at this point is to show some of the mechanical side of things. Um, and then after I show the more mechanical side, I'm going to hand it off to Cedric to talk about electronics and software and, and how the mechanicals were controlled. So I'm going to present <laughs> to our right is Cedric. Um, and this is one of the stages that as, as we worked along the process of putting together the AMBO van. Um, so basically the way it works is uh, what's, what's called a bag valve mask or an AMBO bag is like the proprietary name for it, sits right here in this little cradle underneath this arm. And then this arm goes down and squeezes that bag. So I'll show you a, a, a bag. Um, because that'll help sort of clarify the picture in your client's eyes. So here's one with the bag. And so normally this bag is operated by hand. So a healthcare provider would, in an emergency 
setting on an ambulance or just before the ventilator is connected, squeeze this plastic rubber bag by hand to manually ventilate a person. Um, in a normal off-the-shelf ventilator, that's not how it works. It has pumps and fans, um, but this tool has already been designed to provide breaths to a patient. So we we like the idea that that um, this Ambivent group came up with to just squeeze that bag to provide ventilations. Um, and and something that I want to touch on, just you know, to, that JR already touched on, is that we wanted to work on this project because it was a technological challenge and because there was potential for it to offer great value. Um, but the whole time, we were obviously very much hoping that it would not be needed, um, that this was something that we would get to talk about a few months later and, and be excited about having worked on. Um, but it, you know, it, it was, um, yeah. That said, we were at every point trying to make sure we were making decisions that would uh, offer the best chance possible of, of being a useful tool if it were needed, either here or abroad in other places where they might not have super fancy Yale ventilators. So this is the arm that goes up and down and squeezes the bag. It pulls in oxygen from the back um, and, uh, and, then, and then pushes it into the lungs of the patient. There are a bunch of factors that you need to control for, as you might imagine, the speed or the rate of the breathing, uh, how deep the breaths are, so how far down that arm is pushing. Uh, you want to be able to control the maximum pressure, so people's lungs become less compliant when they're sick, and you don't want to overpressurize a lung. You could burst a lung, which would obviously be catastrophic. So uh, this line that goes ends in that green little nozzle that goes into the machine goes to a pressure sensor. And so that's telling it what pressure it's detecting so it knows not to exceed that pressure. Uh, the body is made out of aluminum. We started, so this was, this was a mistake that I made early on, which was sourcing 6061 aluminum, uh, which is a great alloy for a bunch of things, but not for bending. It is brittle and doesn't like to bend. So uh, it was cut out on the water jet. So the water jet's a tool that we got maybe a year ago. I forget how long ago it was. Uh, but it's a pretty incredible tool that shoots water at 30,000 PSI and mixes it with a garnet abrasive. And it can cut most anything short of diamonds. So we used it to cut out this aluminum uh, that we you know, took them may, off. Or, may, I, may I share some photos of the water jet working on this? Sure. Yeah. So we, um, we cut the aluminum on the water jet and then used a brake, which is a, a metal bending tool, to put these lines in it. Uh, but as I mentioned, one of the, the first stumbles that we made was the 6061 aluminum is not very bendable. Uh, so we had to anneal it using oxyacetylene uh, to make the metal soft enough so it would bend. And then the next go around, we used a different alloy of aluminum that was more easily bent. On the back, you can see a battery pack. So that was important because you wanted to be able, you wanted this to be able to move with a patient. So if you need a patient to move from room to room, you can't just unplug the machine and tell them to hold their breath. You need it to keep pumping. Also, in, in case of power loss, you need it to be operable. Um, and I mean, that's it's really a, a relatively simple machine. Inside, we have a DC motor. Uh, there are a bunch of 3D printed parts that are printed on the Mark Forged 3D printer. Um, and Jerry, you, there you go. Uh, and you oh, want awesome. the Mark Forge. Uh, so you can see the design. Yeah, so that's a that's a great picture of the design in SolidWorks. So SolidWorks is um, an engineering level CAD program where you can make the designs. One of the great things about SolidWorks is you can drop pieces straight from McMaster car into the design. So many of these pieces in the design are actually pieces straight from the catalog of McMaster car. So you have a bill of materials built into your design 
which is really useful for when you actually want to go and buy the pieces for your uh, for the piece you're making. Uh, here's another model showing the skin of it, of the sheet metal components. So here, you obviously see it in three dimensions. Uh, but when you cut it, it's in two dimensions. It's flat sheet metal. So one of the cool features here in SolidWorks is taking that dimensional shape and flattening it out um, into a flat drawing. The water jet can know how to cut as it in, out of a flat sheet before it's bent. So this is the water jet. Uh, and I just pulled out of it this quarter inch aluminum. And that's used in the arms as well as the frame for the actual uh, arm mechanism. And I think this was, the water jet is an incredible tool. Sometimes it, it causes frustration as all tools do, but I think that this was one experience where it really shone. Uh, we really didn't need to do any secondary operations on our parts except for a little deburring. And it made pieces that would have been incredibly difficult to make otherwise. So this is a cool video of me um, annealing the metal. So these are little tabs uh, that get folded up to hold onto the armature. And what I'm doing is I first deposited carbon onto the metal. So I did that by blowing just an acetylene flame. And that is very, very carbon rich. So it just deposits that black soot. And then I switched over to a neutral flame with a bunch of oxygen in it. And the trick here, is that the that the black soot cooks off, it, it, it gets combusted at around the same temperature that the aluminum anneals. So what I'm doing here is just using that black soot as like a temperature gauge, and I'm cooking off the, or I'm, I'm annealing the metal just at the, at the little tip, at the ends of those fins so that I can bend them upwards. Because in the tempered state of aluminum, it's not, it wasn't bendable. So that was, that's a cool little trick for anyone who's interested. Um, and what was actually interesting there is the step I did before that was water jetting that whole shape in the water jet. Uh, so you can even put you know, pretty large pieces in there if you can work around them. Here's a video of the water jet in action, sped up. Um, and you can see on the upper right corner that pink uh, cylinder that's holding the garnet abrasive uh, as it gets sucked into the into the nozzle, the mixing tube with the high pressure water. That's Jen, who works at Medtronic and who did a lot of the, the mechanical design. Um, we're here doing submerged water jet cutting just so it's a little quieter and cleaner. Um, then what other cool pictures do we have? So something else we can talk about is the mold making. Um, we The piece that pushes down on the bag valve mask needs to be pretty soft. I mean, this, this bag potentially, but if a patient, the average time that a patient was being treated was about two weeks. Um, so we needed, and you know, if you're taking you know, a whole bunch of breaths per minute, obviously depends on the patient. Um, this bag needs to be able to be squeezed many, many, many thousands of times. So we couldn't have that bare aluminum rubbing on the rubber uh, for a few reasons. One, it might have braided through it. And two, it wouldn't um, get as much air out of the bag as possible. So, uh, and also that the bag had this interesting feature where if you pinched it too far down, it would pucker inwards and then pop up. It would take a little longer to refill. Um, so one of the steps we took was making these um, uh, these pads to put on the arms to help push down on the uh, backs. So what you're seeing here is the first step that we did. On the left is a piece. So this is actually a positive piece that we made out on the mark forge. And on the right is just white PLA that we printed on a normal printer. Um, do they look similar in the picture? What is what you can tell in person is that the resolution is much finer on the Mark Forge versus the PLA has little inclusions and little holes that just and and just the, the layering makes it a little less ideal for mold making. So what we did here is these are the positives, and then we put it. I think Jr. did this. Put it in this cardboard box, um, and in in this box we poured silicone. 
So the blue silicone goes in and it hardens around it. And here you can see me peeling it off. So this blue silicone is being peeled off the mold and it's this really deliciously goopy, rubbery silicone. Uh, and this design was actually, Ben Logan helped us with it, Jared's brother, because he's done a bunch of mold making before. So you can see some of the registration pins, those big holes off to the sides that help the molds align. Uh, and right now I'm just pulling out the little nubs that go through the bolt holes that hold it onto the aluminum. So this is about one half, and then the other half comes off of the white piece. And then the next step, which we probably have video or pictures of somewhere, is those two blue halves of silicone stick together and they fit together really nicely. And then we pour a hardening plastic in liquid form into that mold and let it cure. And it dries very, very rapid, or it cures very rapidly. And, uh, and then we have our piece. And, and the idea behind that versus just 3D printing the original arm, which makes more sense probably, is that by doing it this way, you can potentially make a hundred of them very quickly. So 3D printing is an incredible tool for making one or two or five, a, a low number of things, um, because as a prototyping tool, it, it's remarkable. It would take a long time to machine or, or make something out of wood or plastic some other way. Um, but it, for volume, it's not very good. It becomes very slow again. So one option is injection molding, but another option in this case is casting. So we just poured the plastic into the mold that was based off the first 3D print, and we can very rapidly make a whole bunch of those pieces. So that's a, a pretty great technique. Uh, and, and I guess along the, that line, one of the really fun things about this project was getting to use so many of the different techniques uh, and technologies available at Make Haven for fabrication. Uh, I hadn't done a whole lot with casting before, so that was a pretty cool experience to learn about all the various considerations. My, the first pour we made actually went pretty terribly. The stuff hardened before I even was able to pour it into the mold. Uh, it just hardened so much faster than I anticipated. You know, it gets scalding hot and just just like that was was a rock. Um, so I think maybe I'll, I'll pass it along to Cedric and then I'm sure there'll be ample time at the end for questions. So we can, if there are any bits and or pieces in particular that people are interested in, we can look at those. And I'm happy to talk more about them. If we, if there are any videos of the casting, I'm sure that'd be an interesting thing to, to look at. Uh, the one picture here is of the the slip break, um, slip roll break shear tool. That red tool that we use to bend the metal. So we had to do a little water jetting actually of this tool to get it to make those fingers the right size. So that was sort of interesting. And yeah, so maybe maybe with that, I will pass it along to Cedric, and uh, and after that, we can sort of see if there are any outstanding questions or bits we want to hit on. Awesome. Well, thank you, Lior. Um, so, hi everyone. My name is Cedric. I'm the Makerspace Manager at Sacred Art University, and um, uh, when COVID hit, basically, we were trying to do the same thing. We we started making PPE, but we're a very new space, so we didn't have any of the amazing capabilities that Make Haven has. So when I first met Lior and GR, I was very impressed with what they've done, and I was more than happy to to help um, uh, on the project. So I'm not alone in this. Uh, we've done the electronics and the code. Um, sadly, the other people couldn't be here today, so I'm going to do my best to present their part. Um, so let me let me share my screen. There we go. So uh, what we were trying to do basically is, um, so this is the, the main part of the team. I think I'm forgetting Paul Novak in this, but uh, there's Ben Artin, uh, Justin Rowe, and myself. Um, uh, ben was the overall system designer. Uh, Justin took care of the electronics. I took care of the code. And I believe Paul helped a lot with the sourcing and, and the first steps as well. Um, so. When we joined the, the the project, we were very impressed with uh, Lior's work. Basically, where everything that he just showcased, uh, they've created this amazing uh, machine that can pump on a bag. Now, the electronics was just supposed to be, do the rest and automate all this to make sure that we can um, that we can um, put someone under the ventilator and keep him alive. So the way it's supposed to work is by using a mi what's called a microcontroller. It's a little piece of electronics that's uh, kind of like a brain. You can program it to do whatever you want to do. 
um, we are using in this case well, one of the most popular brand, which is called Arduino, which is the, the one that's used pretty much anywhere in the world. Uh, and that's what Embovan decided to, to use. So in theory, um, it was a very straightforward project. Uh, we were supposed to basically source the parts. And even though there were some, some problems with that, as, as Dior was explaining, because everybody wanted the same things at the same time, um, we were just supposed to source the parts, take their code, and put a bit of love, and there you go. You get cake, you get a functioning machine. Um, so what happened is um, uh, this didn't really pan out that way. Um, um, uh, what happened is um, the Envo event um, showcased a lot of amazing things that the machine was doing, but we didn't find all of the code and all of the electronics based on their uh, what's called the repo. Um, it's a, a place where people share their their source code and their their designs. Um, so we had to be creative. Basically, it didn't work right off the bat as as we thought it would. So um, what did we do? Um, so this is the first part I wasn't part of, so I'm going to try to do the best at, at presenting this. But Ben um, basically looked at the entire system and decided to do an entire um, um, this overall design. So they rethought how the electronics was going to talk to the code and uh, interface with the actual hardware. Um, so he was in charge of doing pretty much that first step of the overall system design. Then Paul apparently sourced all the motors and and um, help um, got the help from the first robotics team, a local team that does uh, robots to that 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 do competitions about solving issues. Um, they have a lot of motors in those teams because they do like physical robot uh, robots that move places. Um, so they loaned us a motor driver and that was really nice of them. Um, and then based on all that information, Justin, who is really great at making electronic boards, uh, starting designing uh, an actual electronic board uh, for the, the system. So what he did is etching. And I believe um, um, there was a picture early on that shared by GR where uh, you can see him um, um, etching um, a piece. But this is what it looks like on the right. Um, so basically, this is something you do yourself. You use chemicals to etch copper off of a board and you create your very own design of circuits and then you can solder onto it to make the first uh, the first case so at that point um we thought well everything is great we just make the design uh we solder everything together we put it in the machine and then you know and then everything works um but what happens very early on is uh it became very unreliable and more importantly it um we we ran into issues where uh, things would start frying. Like we would literally have pieces that would fall, um, uh, that, that would not, uh, that would break, sorry. Um, so after a few minutes of excitement, basically what we, dis uh, what we discovered was um, something is wrong. Like we don't know exactly what, but something is just not right. Um, so we had to do a lot of digging. So we did uh, a lot of iterations. I'll show you a couple of pictures um, uh, in a few minutes. But we noticed that when we started to run the machine uh, once, it was working fine. And then the next time over, the pressure sensor would not respond anymore. Um, so we had to do a lot of digging, a lot of trial and error um, to try to figure out what was wrong with the system. And it uh, turns out that there was a little bit of wrong in everything. So let me explain. Um, so first, the components that were the list of components that were given to us by the Empovan team that we found on their website. Uh, some of them seem to not be fully compatible with each other. Uh, some of them didn't work with the same voltage. So there was some um, voltage issues between the components. And some of them, they, they, they use a protocol called I2C, which uh, allows components to talk to each other the same way computers do over the internet. Um, the problem is some of them, it's not uh, a great norm as, as the internet is. So some of them don't speak exactly the same way. And we found out that our screen was not really fully compatible with the pressure sensor, for example. So we encountered a lot of small issues that added one on top of the other, uh, kind of made for um, a really big uh, problem to unsolve. So it was it was exciting to do so. Um, so we, 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 we started working on the electronics, mostly Justin and Ben. And to get a head start on the code, I made a breadboard version that I could work from home uh, with uh, to make a first working uh, Ambo van. So this is this is kind of like the first um, breadboard version. Um, so a breadboard, for those who might not know, is, is literally um, that tiny plastic piece, um, a white plastic piece where all the cables are. Um, so we, it's a temporary system where 
if you want to um, prototype an electronic solution, you put everything on there. It's not super reliable. You would not want this in a machine, but that allows you to very quickly uh, make your own system, test it out, uh, modify it to, to suit your needs, and then you can move to that etched circuit um, as, as Justin was working on. So we did have some, um, some success. As you saw in the video, it was working. It was moving and it was doing something. Um, um, so we we're pretty pleased with this. So because we had that success, Justin went full on on the electronic side and he created a bunch of, uh, of amazing uh, boards. So if you can see on the left side, you go from the first edge board. Um, uh, that was the first design. Uh, we tested this. We still had some issues with it, so we had to change it. Um, and then he improved the design over time. And I think this is a really good example of how uh, uh, um, any project advances. You go from uh, the very early on steps to more and more refined design by iteration and failure. Basically, you, you try, you fail, and you improve, and rinse and repeat, you do it again. So um, you can see that the next design was we separated the screen and, and the rest of the, but everything else was on the board. And then on the third iteration, and re please remember, Justin had to recreate the, that entire electronic board every time. Uh, so it was a lot of work um, and he did great there. Uh, he actually separated the, the logic board from the, the controllers with the buttons and everything else uh, and the screen um, towards the final design where we couldn't find any more bugs um, between the different sensors and everything else. And, and this is really what, what, what was the big holdout on the electronic side. Um, we, um, it sadly cost a lot, and at the same time, it was a, a, a complicated thing to debug. Uh, on your left side here, you have what sensor we were supposed to use, uh, which is a $60 sensor. Um, it's a very high precision uh, pressure sensor. Um, but it turned out over time that we discovered that it was not fully compatible with other everything else. It didn't necessarily measure exactly the right things and, and so on and so forth. So, so we, we had to learn a lot along the way. Um, and ironically, we, 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 we went to a simpler pressure sensor, but that was fitting our needs more. And that was uh, more um, uh, in line with our needs and more importantly, more reliable because uh, after all, we don't want to kill anyone on the machine, right? Um, so this is this is what we ended up with. Um, uh, Justin did an amazing job um, um, of the electronics of, with the electronics board. Um, this is a custom design, so this is pretty cool. And obviously, it's it's shared on the GitHub, so uh, people could download this and and remake the Make Haven version of of the Embovan if you wanted to. Uh, we did not go all the way and share it back with the original Embovan team, but because uh, we kind of dropped it when COVID. Um, was not as urgent as 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 it was, but that's something def definitely we should do and 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 move toward uh, move for, move forward with. So uh, that was about the electronics. So what about the code? The code it was supposed to be simple. It was supposed to be again you just download it from their website. You 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 upload it to that Arduino board, and and then it works. Um, but some somehow. Um, it didn't really work. Um, um, we, we encountered a lot of issues, which seems to be the same as electronics. I think the Embovan team was just a step ahead of us, uh, but they didn't necessarily share everything that they created at that time. So um, the versions that we got may have had a little bit of issues that we had to fix. So the first thing I'd like to show you is when the machine started working, and please understand uh, it's disassembled in the video. So the front end is disassembled from the main um, body of the machine, but you're going to see it pumping uh, the, the bag and doing its thing. But please notice that um, it's not moving, it's, it's kind of erratic. Um, it's not moving in a proper fashion. And if you were hooked to the machine at that point, uh, you would probably get a lot of air squeezed at once or not air, no air at all. It would be very unpleasant um, um, and more than, more than likely unsafe. So this is what we discovered is basically we had a hard time uh, getting the data from the pressure sensor to the code to make sure that we took the right decisions in terms of making that arm move. Um, because that's how the overall system works. Um, and maybe I should take a minute to explain this. The overall system basically has a couple of uh, buttons and potentiometers and a screen and a pressure sensor and, 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 of course, the motor. So what it does is it's a feedback loop where when the arm moves to press on the, um, to press on the, the bag, uh, the bag um, has a line, the line that you can see here that goes toward the green side that, that, that Leo showcased earlier. Um, that line um, uh, sees the pressure augmenting in technically the lung. Um, and and um, 
you adjust the arm movement based on that and the settings that you can provide to the machine with the different potentiometers and the buttons. And that's the overall way you set up the settings, the arm starts moving and depending on the pressure feedback, the arms, uh, the, the code and the arm tries to adapt to the specific need of the patient. And our first tests were completely erratic. Um, it was not safe. Uh, more importantly, we even had a few issues where the pressure sensor would give a, a, a value that was wrong and uh, then the arm would just basically slam into the, the bag and sometimes uh, even broke the, the, the MarkForge printed um, axis for the arm. Um, and please understand that the MarkForge uses uh, carbon fiber to, to make the, the, the piece pretty strong. So this is, uh, this is pretty hard to break. You would have a hard time breaking this by hand if you tried. Um, so um, this is where we got a few concerns of uh, the code itself not taking the proper decisions based on what the values are inputted by the sensors. Um, and then there was a lot, the, the last problem about the code in general, which is um, how safe is safe enough? Um, uh, we worked out through all the kinks of the both the hardware and the software, and we got to a point where the machine works. Um, this is the good news. Um, but there was also the problem of um, in, in software development, uh, you fix problems when you see them. And, and it's an issue in this case, because if we did not see a problem and shipped the machine, there's this question of maybe there's one that's gonna rise inside of the hospital and is it safe to put someone under, under, under that machine? That was a, a general question that we were asking ourselves quite heavily because by changing the code, you can always induce new errors. By fixing something, you can create new errors. So there, there was always that challenge uh, throughout. But eventually, um, because makers are going to make, uh, we ended up with a functioning system. So um, here's what it looks like. So we didn't fully attach everything, but um, th this is this is when it works. Um, as you can see on the computer on the right side, we had live feedback of all the sensors. We could know exactly what was going on. This is GR and Lior being very happy because this thing working. Um, um, so we eventually fixed it and, and, and we eventually made it work. Um, we never really went towards, because as Leo was explaining, uh, thankfully, it wasn't really needed anymore. Um, the hospitals were not run over anymore and had, had their own fancy machines they could use instead of using our, our last resort machine. Um, so we never really went to the phase where we would test it, but that was going to be our next phase uh, pretty much. So um, that's pretty much it. I just have a random bunch of pictures but I believe uh, GR has, has already shared a bunch of them. Um, uh, but that's pretty much it for the electronics and, and code. And um, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free um, to ask around. I believe there's a Q&A in the end. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so that was, um, that was, that was really great. Thank you, Cedric. And um, it, I mean, at this point, I'd just like to, um, like as a to, to bring it together a little bit, we got it to a point where it, it worked pretty well. Um, we brought most of the code up on GitHub, and, and we will share that with the original Ambo Vent team. Um, and at this point, are, are pretty happy to you know to share what we've learned and and and, and move on. Um, I think I I do want to take the time to thank. The huge number of people who made this project happen. Um, it was we were everyone was in sort of crisis mode, and so people were exceptionally generous with their with their time uh, and their their wisdom and their money um, and res other resources. Uh, and so I, there's a long list of, of people who helped contribute when we when we reached out um, and. Yeah, e even just the team of people who was working on this project was was 15 people long at, at some point. Um, so that that was pretty exceptional to see. And so I just, I mean, I I, I couldn't even begin to list everyone because there, I mean, there were probably 10 different manufacturers in Connecticut who we emailed with who said they, you know, we could use their whole shop, you know, if if need be. Um, they just, you know, needed designs and, and they would start cranking away and people sending us materials. There were manufacturers in Florida and in Minnesota, all over the place who were excited to, to help um, and who offered, you know, I, I remember talking with a machinist who I had never met. It was a friend of a friend and we spoke for an hour with him just giving me advice on aluminum alloys and their different properties and which ones would be best for which purposes. 
Um, so it was really a, a pretty exceptional time. You know, definitely, definitely a, a thin silver lining having so many people being willing to, you know, set aside busy schedules and um, and work on a pretty exciting project together. And and if I may add, uh, Lior, Lior, for example, was always available until what two a.m. <laughs> um, all the time. So um, uh, thanks so much for this. And more importantly, I just like I, I'm the new guy here. I'm I'm new in the area in general. But I, I'd like to point out that I don't think there's a lot of places, uh, even in the country, that that could have pulled this off. Um, we went from a, a bare bone project to a completed system it's it's 95 percent complete um, um and and i've been in a lot of maker spaces and the fact that there's this community around here that, that can do all those things and pull that off is pretty exceptional um i think the the fact that you know the the uh, all the, the the water jet cutting all, all the everything lior did everything all the different teams did ended up being all of the single parts are very complex and i personally was very impressed with the overall quality of of of, of the result in and i really do believe that you can't pull that off in every place on the on. so we're pretty lucky to to have this community around so this is pretty cool and uh i just i'll add that uh being the person that runs things administratively, it was great that people, uh, we had a lot of financial contributions and some major ones, and that allowed us to go forward. And we ordered a lot of things that were wrong and reordered because, you know, we were we were learning. And so, uh, you know, there was contributions at a lot of levels. So, but I want to give people a chance to ask questions. I have a couple of questions if uh, people are feeling shy, but before, uh, before that, yeah, jump in with any questions you have for Lior and Cedric. All right. Seeing that there's no questions, uh, I am going to go to uh, but jump in if you uh, if you're just trying to unmute. I just had one question. Um, yeah. If you go to the next phase of testing, what does it look like? How do you work that out? So one of the people we were working with, um, well, actually, at various points through this through this adventure, we've worked with. Uh, a whole bunch of different doctors at Yale um, and a, a few different endings in the emergency department at Yale. And Yale has a pretty cool place, uh, which is a simulation lab specific for the ED. And I've actually got the chance to, to spend some time there. Um, and they have all kinds of dummies whose purpose is to get tested on. So it's a, it's a fake room and there's a, I guess, a one-way mirror. I can never remember if it's a one-way or two-way. A mirror that's a mirror on one side and other people can see through. Uh, and that's where the other doctors can lend their thoughts and criticism and help run the simulation. So the next step would have been taking the ventilator uh, with some of the physicians from Yale into the simulation lab and doing simulations on the dummies. So they have these incredibly realistic um, robot dummies that you can you can run simulations on that we could have hooked up the uh, the ventilator to, and they have fake lungs and fake sensors and all these things that, that could make sure that it did a good job of getting enough oxygen in at the right pressures and speeds and uh, rates and whatnot. And, and this is an interesting part of any project is basically you never know if you're fully finished. Um, but what you do is you have a process to validate um, if it's good enough, right? Uh, there was a question earlier of like how safe is safe enough? Uh, basically, uh, maybe there's a bug in this machine that would kill anyone connected to it that we don't know about. So the way to make sure that that doesn't happen is uh, exactly what Lior just explained. You just hook it up to another machine that makes sure that it delivers the proper um, the proper service for a, an extended period of time. So then, you know, there's a threshold to be decided, which I think is either regulation or the hospital themselves. I'm not sure. But there's a threshold. And then when you pass that threshold, you're like, OK, we can ship. This is this is good. And what's interesting is this is true of any project. It doesn't have to be uh, the ambulance ventilator. It could be anything else. Uh, when your car is made, uh, basically, the electronics is tested for a little while against the threshold. And then and then they hope that there's no more bugs. Um, so that's where we were, basically. Yeah, and I think it's it's worth saying that we were talking to the hospital and administrators and asking, in what scenario, what are you going to go to if you run out of ventilators? And they were telling us that, uh, you know, the standards that they use typically would not be in place in a uh, last resort 
uh, standpoint so that they would be expecting to lose people. And so uh, we were anticipating a threshold where the safety margin would have been lower, or it would have been the best thing available. Uh, and, you know, I think that's what uh, ultimately slowed down the project is that uh, it, we don't anticipate that threshold being something we're going to see. And so those these don't really come into play. There's no way this project was going to, under our leadership, move to the point where they would be used in a regular uh, medical uh, setting, uh, because those are a, a lot of a lot of hurdles. It was only that last resort scenario that we had anticipated. Yeah, and I think we can add that uh, that last resort was in place in many places around the world, but um, not necessarily in Connecticut. I believe we had enough ventilators in the end, right? I don't think they ever went above the threshold of the number of ventilators, but there are many places where they went over and they, they this saved lives. So um, um, this yeah. is why they need those kinds of systems. So my, my question for you guys is, uh, well, first of all, was it when you looked at it and decided to go forward, at, at the beginning, and maybe this is more for Lior because you were early on. Uh, did the actual project end up being more or less complex uh, than you had anticipated at the outset? And the types of problems, were they the types of problems you anticipated or the types of problems you ran into uh, a different type of problem than you anticipated at the outset? So I, I would say that it was less complex, but more difficult than anticipated. Uh, I mean, it, it's really a fairly simple mechanism. Uh, I mean, it comes with a bag, so all you need to do is squeeze the bag. And in terms of sensors, you just need to know the position of the arm. You need to know the amount of pressure you're putting into the lungs. Um, am I missing anything? <laughs> so, you know, there's, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. Um, and so I think I think from that, when, you know, when we started looking at the designs, that was uh, pretty exciting. Um, however, that didn't clue us into the challenges that we would face, which um, came from the design side, but also just came from the nature of the beast and trying to work really quickly. And you know, this this wasn't people's full time job. Um, and we didn't, you know, have a lot of resources that in a normal situation we would have had, uh, hu human resources. So I think that we, we faced challenges uh, that were unexpected and the, the problems that we faced in, in my mind when assessing it from the get-go, I was looking at it from, a, from an engineering, like what are the capabilities we need to do this and how complicated a system is it? Uh, and it didn't strike me as a, as a terribly complicated. It was pretty pretty bare bones. Um, you know, it's a few buttons, a few potentiometers. You know, not a crazy amount of code, and um, you know, it seemed it seemed pretty feasible. And I think it was. I, I think it it just put us through the runner with how many unforeseen little hurdles there were that were very difficult to troubleshoot. Uh, I think you know there. Sometimes you just you get lucky, and, and I mean there are always problems. It's uh, you never have a, a project of any size that has no problems, but you know your luck determines how hard those problems are to troubleshoot. And we had a lot of nights, very 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 late nights, trying to track down problems with oscilloscopes. And I mean, Justin is really top notch. I mean he he is a top notch electronics guy. And there was a lot of head scratching of just just really not being able to find the bugs. Um, and, and sometimes you, you get a you get a remember that after four hours working on a problem, sometimes you kind of lose it a little bit. So at the end, you know, we we were checking if the wires were not uh, was soldered in the wrong way. Or um, it, it's really it's really interesting how we went from. Uh, I completely agree with what Lior said. It went from that. Oh, it, it looks okay, right? I mean, there's only an arm. The pressure sensor will be fine. Uh, and then the devil is in the detail, right? So we went to, is the pressure sensor, you know, is, is this wired right? Or did we switch the cables? What did we do wrong? And and, and the devil definitely was in the details, where it takes hours on ends to figure out those small bugs. Uh, but it, you learn a lot in the process too. So this wasn't an anticipated need and we reacted very quickly. And I think it, 
you know, that, that's a benefit to the community, right? That we had, there's some capacity within the, the population to do a unanticipated response. Uh, and there'll be something uh, that is, you know, different in its nature, but requires some sort of uh, response. And what is it that we've learned from this um, rapid response and the challenges we saw here that we can now prepare ourselves for this next thing that we don't know what it is? Are there generic uh, positional structural things that we can do so that we're better prepared for the next unknown? So I would, I think, you know, hindsight's 2020. Um, I think that in this case, the ventilator became a real struggle of a project. And I don't think there's really anything we could have done to predict that. Um, were we to do it over again, I think I would have chosen to focus on some different projects. Um, I think what we could have done is offer a supporting role to other teams. You know, if, if the Israeli team was really far ahead, then we could have offered design support. We could have converted over to the standard American, you know, the system of, of measurement we use in the United States so that it could be used more readily here. Um, and, and then when they had gone through all of their testing and whatnot, you know, we could have just bought the units from them or, or the hospitals could have. So I think in that way, we could have joined efforts and, and worked a little more efficiently. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm slowly getting to answer the answer to your question, but I think you know, were we to look at it again, I think I would do an assessment of which projects you wanted to work on a little more carefully with sort of the cost reward being more at the forefront versus the desire to work on a really cool project. Um, the ventilator is a really cool project, but it's also very difficult. Um, and it was, there was a relatively low chance of it being required versus something like a capper, which is the, you know, what you see people use in the hospitals sometimes where they, it's a fully enclosed uh, respiratory system where they get air pump through a filter into their headpiece so that um, they're breathing very clean air. It's just short of a, of a full self-contained breathing apparatus. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that is much lower, you know, if it fails, no one dies immediately. It's the kind of thing that people need in a hospital and in every other setting. I'm sure there are lots of hairdressers that would like to use that so they could offer haircuts more easily and safely. Um, and many, many more of them are presumably needed uh, because it, you know, that's protecting yourself from an airborne pathogen is something that a lot of people right now are concerned with, not not just people in hospitals. Um, and it's something that we could design and and come up with designs for and pass along to help other people make, which is sort of more in keeping with the Make Haven um, mindset. So I think that for future challenges would sort of inform me to look at at projects that. Um, that that just have a have a have an input to output reward ratio that is a, a little more comfortable, um, and really assess whether the project that we're working on is is a is a good use of resources, or if we could better support someone else who's working on that project uh, using our own resources. If, if there are ways that we can use the tools at our disposal. You know, if we can do some iteration or some prototyping, if they need to see how something would work, you know, we can still use all the equipment here to, to help facilitate them um, without branching off entirely. Um, so I think, uh, I, I, you know, I don't know how transferable, like it's always, you know, you say, you, everyone says they would do things a certain way in a crisis and then the moment hits and there's no real telling. Um, and even now, you know, as we as we sit here in the aftermath, it's easy to to critique and say we do it differently in the future. Um, but every situation is different. And you know, if someone came and said, "Hey, we need this now," I have no no doubt in my mind that I would hop up and get to work immediately. Um, so yeah, so you, you never know. But I, I do think that making something um, that has more mass uh, use and is, is simpler, you know, could be something that, you know, the, the, I think, for example, the face masks really took off. I mean, I don't remember the final number, but it was 
five, 10,000, some extraordinary number of masks that may even help facilitate the making of by members and non-members all around, there you go, the New Haven County and, and, and beyond. Um, and I think that in my mind really showcased the, the capabilities of our coordination and instructive abilities, you know, if not necessarily the tools strictly at Make Haven. So some combination thereof, I think would be a project that I'd be really excited to take on if, if the need were to rise again. So I have my uh, last question, unless uh, feel free to jump in if someone else has one. But uh, my last question is there's this idea of if you're making one versus designing something for mass production versus designing our design for, that would then be used as a distributed um, design and for distributed manufacturing. So for example, sourcing all the things you can find regionally or in the US. And tell me about the mindset uh, you had for which of those you're trying to achieve with this project and how that uh, affects your decisions. Yeah, so I'd say we transitioned over the course of the project. I think we started in the beginning working with the mindset of we need to make some or design something, come up with a set of plans that we can bring to a manufacturer, put it in their lap and say run. Uh, and, and, that, and that definitely informs design decisions in terms of what materials we use, how things are machined. For example, the axle that Cedric showed the picture of that broke is printed on the Mark Forged. Um, that in its, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about that part because it was probably the most complicated mechanical component of the of the entire design. Everything else was, you know, pretty two dimensional, and then it's either folded or cut with a single operation. But that axle had, you know, multiple both turning and milling operations were it to be made in a typical manufacturing setting. If it were to be cast, uh, it would be a little bit easier, but that introduces its own problems um, because we use bearings. Um, and so I, I think you know that was that was one piece where we we went through a bunch of iterations to get to a place where we we thought that, that would be good in terms of manufacturing at scale. Uh, and then I think as 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 time went on, we just wanted the darn thing to work. And so we started making things that <laughs> that were it was a lot of three D printing, for example, which is not something that is great from a manufacturer's perspective. Uh, it is good from the other perspective you mentioned, which would be a more distributed manufacturing uh, method, you know, where where other maker spaces are making them and they have 3D printers. And similar to how a lot of the face shields were made by other groups where they use 3D printers. But from our perspective, a 3D printer is a serious bottleneck when it comes to making anything but at scale. So we opted instead for using components we could cut out on lasers and, uh, and whatnot. Um, not everyone has a water jet, right? So when we are pretty frequently thinking about how this could both be manufactured and fixed abroad in areas with with not water jets, uh, and and I think that is something that that's a bit of a compromise. There was such a cool tool that we had that made it so easy, um, and we figured that you know the the design would have to be modified somewhat. So I think we initially liked the idea of it being able to be readily manufactured in lots of different ways, and then, um, and then sort of, we just we got more and more goal oriented of, of getting the thing done. Um, but you're right; I think there are a lot of different ways of thinking about it, and I think we we thought about it from pretty much all of those perspectives at various points in the project, depending on how we were feeling. Yeah, and, uh, if, uh, it's okay. Yes, Cedric. But oh, you're muted. Uh, no, someone else was talking. Hold on. Okay, that was me. Oh, Rich, you're really quiet. Yeah, you're really quiet. Something's wrong with oh, your microphone. It is? Okay, let me back out and I'll turn up the gain. I'll come back in. Okay. Okay. But I was going to say, in the in the end design, um, um, you can see all the thoughts that were put into the production of the the, 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 the Ambo vent ventilator because right now he mentioned 3d printing like if i if i show you this one there's almost no 3d printing involved there's everything is pretty much streamlined the electronics you have to understand that you're not supposed to make yourself you, you buy that from a provider they're worldwide you can find them anywhere so you can literally get the shit part f for you and 
and you only have to solder in worst case scenario you, you don't even have to do that in most cases um, so for the electronics part um, it would have been pretty straightforward for the code you just download and, and, and upload really the challenges were were I mean it was really designed to be manufactured and it could be uh, fairly easily this except for the point that Leo was making with the, which, which is the frame itself on the water jet but everything else is fairly straightforward any maker space on the planet and I'm sure you guys know there's there's everywhere on the planet um, can make those things um, and even if and you didn't have the frame out of metal this is a last resort solution I'm pretty sure wood would, would work fine if, if it saves a life right so um, yes definitely this is something that could be done worldwide I believe and I think we even like to the point of which connectors we used was informed by how we, we wanted, you know, say a board burnt out, it was hit by lightning or something. We wanted someone able to be able to just drop in a new board. And so we made sure that a lot of the connections were uh, resistant to vibration and weren't going to pop off, but were also, you know, swappable. So you could, you know, instead of trying to troubleshoot with a multimeter, you can just swap in a new board. I mean, one of the things that really blew my mind through this process was just how the, the PCB printing companies, how incredibly cheap and fast they are. I mean, it really is pretty mind boggling what they can do. By the end, one of the, one of the people working on this project, Justin, has, is like really focused on price, which was great. Um, and he was doing most of that design work. But when I started realizing that you could get the solder stencils for like a dollar, I, I mean, you know, so with, with those two, I can all, um, I'll grab it right now because it's right here. So this is a sheet of aluminum uh, that has, I'm going to put it close to the camera. Can people see the holes? Yeah, yeah. If you hold it still and put it closer, maybe. Yep. Yeah. So this is a pretty big sheet of aluminum. And I guess they probably used a laser to cut out these holes. And those holes are in the pattern of the patches on the PCB where we wanted to attach the components. And this was $2. I mean, it's that it was just mind blowing to me how, how cheap each of these components was. And just having this saves an hour of time instead of like trying to dab the, the solder on by hand um, before you put it in the reflow oven. Um, so I think, and that was just sort of a, a brief aside, but the, um, yeah, we, having that ability makes it really possible you know we could even send if we were to be sending out these ambo vents um you could send it with five extra boards just just because just in case all right can you hear me now or am i still too low you're still too low you just why don't you just ask it quick and ask it loud well it's actually uh, a series of questions my first th this was an arduino project is that true yes yeah. it is Okay, and uh, how many different analog inputs were you uh, keeping track of, and what? And did you have analog outputs, and did you have any encoders here? I know you mentioned you were trying to keep track of the arm position, and were you using any standard uh, control loops, and also was there any USB outputs for computer monitoring? And one other last question was, the, was there any attempt to uh, simulate the, uh, the the design? Not necessarily the. Um, uh, was there any attempt to simulate the the design on a different computer, where you weren't really hooked up to the real world in any way? You were just testing the ideas of adjusting the variables. So those are those are just my questions. Well, thanks for your question. Uh, I'll answer the last part first. So we did not simulate, which. Um, could have been really helpful in uh, making the, um, the software side uh, more reliable. Um, uh, we didn't really have enough time for that, but uh, for everything else, I, we, we definitely uh, we definitely did this. So ironically, we were almost at the max of an Arduino where we couldn't plug anything more, but we didn't have to, we're still able to just use the one Arduino for everything. So uh, to give you a quick run through, um, we have, um, I believe three potentiometers, three buttons, a couple of LEDs, uh, one screen that's over I square C. So you communicate with the screen. You don't necessarily directly display to it. There was a motor controller to make the, the arm move. And there was an encoder on the axis. Um, you're right to mo monitor the position of the arm. Um, 
and 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 then there's obviously the pressure sensor which was the feedback for for from quote unquote the human side um, um, and that that's pretty much it for the electronics itself um, um, and and all of it was connected to an Arduino um, um, at first it was a, I forgot the name of the, the special version but we ended up using a nano in the end uh, which works the same way but we were maxing out pretty much all the inputs and outputs of the the, the Arduino at that time Thank you for the answers. Appreciate it. Yeah. So um, let me show you guys something. So the Israeli team, which we should also just give a shout out to them. They were available. They joined our webinars. And even though there were maybe some some challenges for all they did, they're amazing. And um, the uh, what I want to show you is. Should be playing soon. There it goes. So, you know, there's a test running. Um, you know, and so they had. Um, As you can see here, we have the exact monitoring of the dog, including the ventilation volumes, and it all seems to be lining up very well with the uh, preset settings. And we can up the ventilation rate. Now we're going to up it all. With the cold snare. And uh, this week, we're going to talk about how to manage a large uh, pollock. And I'm delighted to have. Um, so, but yeah, so you could see the monitoring uh, and the testing uh, that was done by the by the team, both on in the simulations, uh, as far as uh, individual uh, you know dummies, and also even live animal testing, and then they submitted a, a letter based on their. Uh, their own government's assessment of what the reliability and so on was. Um, it was not obviously like an approved thing, but they were, uh, they were doing a lot of the heavy lifting in order to get it into a position where it could be approved in an emergency situation. And that's, um, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons that even though Lior said that we could have collaborated more um, and just used more of what was out there, uh, I remember at the time the sense of urgency and that they, you know, I can't uh, complain about the level of availability that that team had and the efforts that they made to try and make independent teams like ours successful. And, and I, I think I'll add this. Uh, first, Richard, I forgot to ask you to answer you. Uh, you saw some uh, plotting on the on their screen. Um, in the code that we had, um, we didn't have anything like this. There was some placeholder for some sort of a remote connection, but um, it wasn't implemented in the code that we could download from their website. So I did create like a whole uh, live. Um, if you actually look at uh, some of the videos that uh, GR and I showed, you see me pointing at the screen with like tons of lines going through. Um, uh, we didn't go plotter, but we did have a lot of feedback from uh, the different sensors live through the USB. So I forgot to, to answer that, um, sorry. But uh, if I can um, uh, summarize something that both GR and Lior touched uh, about, which is, um, first, I keep on saying, that, you know, we didn't have something from the Embovan team, but um, I still, I'm very grateful for their work. Um, uh, I think everybody re needs to remember that everybody was a volunteer in this. Um, so they've done an amazing job. We were very lucky to be able to grab from their, from their repo and, and start building this amazing project. And um, Lior did a great job at explaining that, yes, maybe we could have picked a different project and do something simpler, uh, but overall, I'll say this, uh, my gut feeling about this is um, uh, when when GR was asking, you know, what could you do to prep for another one? I'll say this. Um, not only we went from uh, nothing to something in uh, a short amount of time, everybody was doing this as a volunteer. So on top of their regular jobs. Um, so if you compare the amount of time that was dedicated to this and the results, I'm actually thinking that we're pretty efficient. Um, uh, 
knowing that we are not fully organized, like yours, not my boss, I'm not his, but you know, we, we, we were not organized like a regular company, yet we were able to achieve some good results in the short amount of time that we dedicated to this. And, and, and more importantly, to prep for the future, I think you just do that again. Um, uh, I, I, was, I, I knew about Makehaven, but um, I was not included in it. Uh, thanks to working in that project. Now I know Lior, I know GR. I think that Justin knows a lot more about electronics now. He learned along the way. We all learned along the way. So I think just it's pretty much the maker answer, right? Is by making you learn more and by collaborating with others, you, you collaborate better. So I, I think that just the fact that we've done this makes that makes for the fact that we are prepped for another if, if COVID, that's not a, a hope, but if COVID were to hit hardly again, we're almost ready with this device. And more importantly, if there was any other device to be made, then um, I think we'd be much faster at doing it just because of everything we've learned. So overall, I think it's a massive success in the sense that, you know, who else can do this? I mean, think about it. Companies take years to develop products. Um, we took a bunch of volunteers, a little amount of money, and we made something pretty great in a short amount of time. So I'm, I'm, I don't know for the others, but I'm pretty proud to have been part of this. Another quick question. Uh, first, uh, congratulations, you guys. That was uh, quite an achievement. And um, and I, I really like it that it's, you know, you, you're getting started. I mean, you know, if, if you had to do it again, you'd probably make uh, the revs two or three even better than this one. It would evolve over time. But here's one last question for you. Back on the motor that's actually actuating the arm. Were you using a servo motor or did you have a DC motor that you were just running forward and backwards or was it on a cam so that it was always running forward just for satisfied my curiosity? Exactly what were you controlling? So the motor itself is a, uh, Lior, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a, a windshield, uh, not a windshield, a, a car window uh, motor controller, right? Uh, so it's a DC motor technically, right? Um, but you do have a, so you do have a motor controller uh, attached to the, to the motor itself, and then the encoder acts as the uh, the feedback loop for for that motor. So basically, you would push it until the encoder says. So the code and the encoder would decide until you when you stop uh, pushing on the on the arm. Um, so so technically, would... it's a, it's what's called a, co a closed a closed feedback loop. So uh, you would not just hope for a position, which is what you do in three D printing most of the case, right? You you hope that the machine goes that way, but you yeah. don't actually know. In this case, because it's crucial to know exactly where the arm is, because that 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 is um, uh, important not to push too hard to kill someone. Um, so it was a close feedback. We send the impulse to the motor, but at the same time, we're checking that it was actually done that way. I, I got that. And so, but there are times when the control algorithm actually reverses the current in the motor. Is that right? Got it. All right. That's what I was looking for. Okay. Thanks, uh, thanks for answering all my questions. I very much appreciate that. And congratulations yeah, thanks for to you all. I mean, that was a that was an accomplishment. My hat goes off to you. Uh, great job. Thanks. Great. Well, I think we are at a good spot. Of course, if there's any questions remaining with the group, we're happy to entertain them. Uh, but seeing that there don't seem to be any, I think we can uh, conclude this presentation. And I conclude it, of course, by saying uh, thanks to the folks, all the folks who worked on it, particularly onto Cedric and Lior, who both poured in many hours. And thank you for uh, doing a debrief and sharing the, the project uh, with us so that we can, we can learn from it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. everyone it's for joining. Yeah. So much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.